Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, it is my pleasure to join you today to talk about mechanisms for stronger international cooperation and the protection of Georgian cultural heritage. My comments are going to be applicable to both Georgia and for our colleagues in Ukraine, but are especially going to focus on the nexus of US international cultural policy um, as regarding occupied territories and what could be done under these very difficult circumstances. And I want to say at the outset, I have great admiration for the work that everyone has been doing to try and protect their cultural heritage. Georgian cultural heritage in the territories occupied by Russian supported separatists is well established to be under real immediate threat, especially through unsanctioned non-scientific archeological excavations an intentional lack of upkeep, conservation work that erases traces of Georgian material culture, and the deliberate erasure of cultural places. As an alteration of the cultural landscape, these negative interventions appear to be intended to delegitimize Georgian territoriality by undermining historical connections, while at the same time advancing irredentist claims. Georgian heritage professionals have clearly labored to document instances of cultural loss, as we've seen today, raise them to international attention, and to reimagine new futures in the absence of physical access to heritage places. The papers in this symposium have offered considerable documentation of problems and challenges in Georgia that has implications for other countries in the European Union's Eastern Partnership and beyond. My contribution offers a different kind of intervention. Rather than discussing specific instances of damage, I want to consider the steps that can be taken through new developments in bilateral relations with the United States, specific collaborations through academic exchanges, and forms of heritage labor and action that can be undertaken to assist Georgian heritage professionals and conflict affected communities in the near term. Here I will discuss the benefits that come from developing a bilateral agreement on cultural property protection, particularly with the United States, enhancing transnational researcher networks, and documenting undamaged heritage sites and collections. I propose that steps to realize these goals may result in real tangible benefits to Georgians and the preservation of the country's unique heritage. First, Bilateral agreements with the United States under the Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act of 1983, or what I will call the CCPIA, represent a vital diplomatic and academic arena for engaging on cultural heritage issues. Now, up front, I admit, it is not obvious how or why a bilateral agreement under this law would enhance cooperation for the protection of cultural heritage. However, in the United States, a bilateral agreement is the starting point for formal educational, cultural, and law enforcement exchanges on the topic of cultural heritage protection between the United States and a foreign country. The CCPIA is the legal mechanism that the United States relies upon to implement the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the means of prohibit prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. Unlike other countries in which the 1970 UNESCO Convention is self-executing, implemented through the 1995 UNIDWAT Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects, or fulfilled through the recognition of valid export licenses, the United States requires that a country bring a formal request to the United States Department of State for import restrictions on looted or trafficked archaeological and ethnographic objects. A request to the US Department of State must offer a narrative about the country's history and material culture, its museum infrastructure, and its heritage professionalization programs. It must also address four specific criteria. First, 
how archaeological and ethnographic objects in the requesting country are in jeopardy from pillage. Second, how the requesting country has taken measures to protect its cultural patrimony consistent with the 1970 convention. Third, how other countries that also have an import trade for the same kind of objects have restricted the trade in the same artifacts. And finally, how import restrictions would be consistent with the interest of the international community in the interchange of cultural material for scientific, cultural, and educational purposes. Following the submission, the US President's Cultural Property Advisory Committee meets to review the request to make a recommendation to the Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs on whether to enter into a bilateral agreement. But the Assistant Secretary of State remains the final decision maker. If Georgia were to submit a bilateral agreement request, it would join Bulgaria and Turkey as the only other countries in Eastern Europe with such a bilateral agreement. Now this process seems convoluted and frankly, it can be quite burdensome. Undertaking the work though matters a great deal because it offers a way to strengthen relations with the United States and its community of heritage professionals. If a bilateral agreement is agreed to, it creates a designated list of undocumented archeological and ethnographic objects that can no longer be trafficked to the United States. But I think more importantly here, it also establishes a framework concerning mutual co cooperation on cultural heritage issues between the United States and a requesting country, including the provision of technical assistance and mutual aid. As part of the formal bilateral agreement, this, this language becomes a way for the United States to channel its financial support. It also is a signal to the American academic community on topics of shared concern between the United States and a requesting country. Every bilateral agreement now has a corresponding action plan, which has certain provisions that are specific to the requesting country, especially in countries with destabilized borders, with active or frozen conflicts, or where the risk of cultural cleansing is present, an action plan represents a specific outline of goals and priorities for cultural heritage protection, and US funding. For a country such as Georgia, a bilateral agreement and a corresponding action plan could provide a way of galvanizing more US attention and support about the cultural loss occurring in the country due to territorial occupation. They are also ways of encouraging the development of transnational research. Now, a second way to enhance the cooperation on the protection of Georgian cultural heritage is to deepen international alliances and networks across countries for research, education, and training opportunities on cultural heritage topics. And I have listened to outcomes of many of these kinds of collaborations that are underway today. In many ways, this conference represents the potential of these networks. At issue is how they form and are sustained in often very adverse circumstances. Most research efforts on cultural heritage and conflict have centered on the crisis or post-crisis documentation of heritage sites, especially damage as a result of archeological site looting or intentional destruction. Much of this effort is done as a mechanism of hope for legal accountability in the future we know considerably less about what appears to be a global phenomenon involving both the strategic intent and systematic coordination of efforts to deliberately destroy heritage sites, conduct misleading and inaccurate reconstruction and conservation, and erase heritage sites in ways that mask historical claims or invent new irredentist rights. Too often cultural heritage destruction is viewed by policymakers or even in the social sciences as unfortunate collateral damage to conflict, rather than part of a deliberate strategy of civilian targeting and instrumental conflict gains. A needed next step for our research community of international heritage professionals is to determine outstanding and significant research questions that can be investigated as part of a coordinated research program. We need a larger and more sustained and systematic enterprise. It is not possible to enhance academic works in the case of Georgia or Ukraine or other countries facing political instability or conflict 
without considering how these situations impact the ability of individual local researchers to, to conduct academic scholarship and the important work of documentation. Already few opportunities exist for scholars in these countries and consequently what I call here conflict affected researchers or CARs for short are often unable to participate in global research consortia, engage with scholarly networks or access state of the field research publications, thereby limiting the reach of their scholarly contributions. Compounding this challenge, CAR concerns are often excluded from research priorities as international scholarly communities develop. Moreover, CARs may experience impediments in progressing in academic fields and have their academic work delayed by a, by a lack of security, voluntary and involuntary migration, and limited professional opportunities. They may not have access to institutional resources in order to conduct their work, publish, or to secure grant funds. They may also be unable to travel to professional events and research hubs to develop professional connections. For these reasons, especially when dealing with the violence that accompanies intentional cultural destruction, there's an ethical imperative to integrate CAR concerns at the beginning of research planning and design. This commitment further ensures that research networks not only address training, but the actual work of collaborative scholarship. Crucially, it will also ensure that CAR research priorities, lived experiences and expertise are integrated into international discussions about the destruction and loss of cultural heritage. The realization of collaborative international networks can only, can only uh, broaden the perspective that is brought about um, through the participation of CARs with their international colleagues. Less work has been considered how this integration might occur in practice. Following research scholarship in the field, it may be possible to build better collaborative international networks by giving special attention to First, strengthening CAR research cap capabilities. Second, enhancing connections to international collaborators. Third, encouraging access to mentors. And fourth, promoting field specific research techniques, tacit knowledge, and in field collaborations. In many respects, these issues are in the background when we talk about how to research and document cultural heritage destruction. To build better international networks, we need to bring them to the center of our field's conversations. Finally, we turn to how international agreements and international networks and collaborations, including CARS, can build on the work of documenting heritage sites and collections. Many of us in the international heritage field came to it with formal training as archeologists. And as archeologists, we are very concerned with the loss of context that results from site looting. The 1970 UNESCO Convention is something of a shibboleth, but remains our ethical lodestar and the effort to arrest ongoing cycles of poverty-driven or conflict-driven pillage. Our field's focus, too, has been on what is below the surface, on excavated, specifically because it provides the contextual data that is necessary for our field's approach to reconstructing the past. But the present situation of Georgian cultural heritage reminds us that conflict-driven cultural heritage destruction is a different problem than what we typically think of as archaeological site looting. The issue is also the theft of architectural material, sculpture, friezes, and inscriptions from above-ground historic and archaeological sites and post-excavation collections, precisely the material that we might think is safe or at least less likely to be pillaged as well as the purpose of erasure of these objects in occupied territories, precisely to alter underlying conflict dynamics. Now, the 1970 UNESCO Convention anticipates the need and implementation of both, in country, of both countrywide and institution level inventories of cultural property. Under Article 5b, state parties commit to establishing and keeping up to date on the basis of a national inventory of protected property a list of important public and private institutional inventories, um, but whose export would constitute an appreciable impoverishment of the national cultural heritage. While such an inventory seems more aspirational than operational in practice, institutional inventories seem more feasible. 
Under Article 7B1, state parties commit to prohibit the import of cultural property stolen from a museum or religious or secular public monument or similar institution in another state party, provided that such property is documented as appertaining to the inventory of that institution. In other words, um, so I was saying that so long as an object is documented in an inventory, there are greater legal safeguards internationally. Um, in the United States, the CCPIA provides that no <clears throat> article of cultural property doc documented as being an inventory which is stolen may be imported into the United States. For this reason, the US Department of State has encouraged countries with bilateral agreements to protect cultural heritage under the CCPIA to undertake thorough and complete inventories. For instance, the US Department of State has paid for the completion of specific museum inventories in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. While these provisions are some of the few foreign policy mechanisms that the US government has to encourage countries to conduct inventories that can assist in cultural property recovery, it is also the case that these inventories might not be completed in many cases. Moreover, in conflicts, a proprietary inventory might well go missing or destroyed, which we have seen happen in Syria and Iraq in recent years. The importance of these legally driven inventories should not be discounted, but I do want to suggest that more needs to be done and that international research networks with participating CARs are uniquely poised to act. It should not be assumed I have found internationally that heritage buildings or collections are well or completely documented. Buildings do not often have strong baseline documentation. Collections and storage are often not well documented or their inventories are in a format that cannot be used in the service of recovering those objects following a conflict. So often building and collections documentation has been reactive following the onset of acute conflict or has been ad hoc and remains unavailable to the larger scholarly and law enforcement community. Our field needs to undertake a specific concerted effort for proactively documenting immovable heritage and museum collections in regions experiencing conflict or political instability, especially in those specific areas at risk of borderization or occupation. This topic is one of the international heritage community and archeological community seems poised and trained to undertake. And it is one that when done well can be undertaken collaboratively with local communities, heritage takers and cars. Only with this documentation in hand, will we be, be, at, will we be better able to understand the political dynamics that threaten Georgian heritage as well as international peace and security. To conclude, the situation facing the preservation of cultural heritage in Georgia is challenging indeed. As heritage professionals, we see cultural loss and we feel the need, in fact, the duty to respond for the sake of our colleagues, for local communities and for future generations. But these concerns are only part of a larger geopolitical picture. Caught in the social condition of a frozen conflict, cultural heritage destruction is a symptom of a contemporary disease the systematic undermining of international peace, security, and governance. My aim in raising awareness about the importance of developing bilateral agreements on cultural property protection with the United States, enhancing trans transnational researcher networks, and documenting undamaged heritage sites and collections in areas at risk is to emphasize that they are a way that we can respond to these challenges that are of our day and of our present. I hope that we will all be able to seize this opportunity together. Thank you so much for listening.